Last year, the team at Astronus launched their first commercial satellite into space. Stage separation confirmed. Their smaller, low-cost telecom satellites represent a major breakthrough for the aerospace industry. And they're also the first ever YC Bat company to actually launch something into space. All of this had its beginning here in a small apartment in downtown San Francisco. When I met you eight years ago, you were just a guy who had an idea to build a satellite company, and now you're a guy who's actually built a satellite company. Yes, that is true. It was just me and Ryan, just hanging out in an apartment. Turns out minimum viable product for a geostationary telecommunications spacecraft is not very minimal. So how does a small scrappy startup go from building satellites in a tiny apartment to launching satellites into space and being worth billions? We went to Astronus to find out. YC has funded some of the most successful hard tech companies of the last decade. I think there's a misconception that in order to start a hard tech company, maybe you have to be already a billionaire like, you have to be Elon, like Elon Musk, Musk or Palmer Lucky, or you need to be able to raise like tons of money from investors. And YC only invests $500,000. It's not obvious to a lot of people how you could use that to start a hard tech company. It's mind boggling how a company like Astranis that went through the bat made progress during the bat. Like, what can you do with so little when satellites cost like millions of dollars to like ship? So we visited the co-founders of Astranis to find out how they pulled it off. So John, you built a satellite company. <laughs> yeah. That's insane! <laughs> You're accustomed to this because you live in it every day, but to me, it's still insane that you actually did this. So let's start with the basics. What is Astranis? At Astranis, we build a special new kind of satellite that actually we think the first of its kind. So we build small satellites for high orbits. What's the path that took you here? How did you learn how to start a satellite company? I'm an aerospace engineer by, by background. Did that job for a little while. Spent a little bit of time at, at, uh, on some big satellite programs and just knew that that was not for me. Then there was a moment where we realized, hey, nobody is going and taking a new approach, new technology, next generation satellite designs for high orbits and specifically this this super valuable orbit called geostationary orbit so it seemed worth taking a crack at how did you end up recruiting ryan and turning this from an idea into a startup ryan and i met over 20 years ago so we were both involved in this student organization called students for the exploration and development of space we got to know each other through that and then reconnected when he moved to san francisco to start a job at uh, a company called Planet. Which is one of the like like pioneering space startups. 100%. Right? Once he moved to San Francisco, uh, we started talking about, you know, busy ideas for, for new space companies. So you guys did kind of have the exact right background to do this because you've been working with all the biggest companies in the space, understanding like the business problems. And he was an early engineer at like the key early startup that like pioneered the idea that startups could build their own satellites. And so it makes sense. Yeah, I think it was definitely like a little bit of right place at the right time. So you mm. had this idea, you recruited Ryan, you guys decided to work on this together. Yeah. How did this become a startup? How did how, how did you take the first steps? Applying to YC was one of the first steps. Astronus did YC in winter 16. And winter 2016 was a very special time to be starting an aerospace company. It was at the very beginning of when other founders, inspired in part by Elon Musk and the success of SpaceX, started starting their own aerospace companies. And it was right on the cutting edge, so it wasn't clear that it was possible for a YC-style company that didn't have a billionaire founder to actually start an aerospace company. But it turns out that it was exactly the right time to do it. In fact, in 2016, YC funded three aerospace companies, Astronus, Boom, and Relativity Space, that are now all billion-dollar companies. John and Ryan got into YC, but they knew that they were facing long odds of being able to raise the large round at the end of YC that they needed to put a satellite into orbit. And so they responded by setting crazy, ambitious goals for what they could accomplish during the batch, so that they knew that if they could accomplish those goals, it would be impossible for investors to ignore them. How did you get started? I mean, what was kind of the day zero of it? 
So I guess one of the key things with especially building sort of these hard tech things and things that have to go, you know, something really far away in a very harsh environment was figuring out how can you start small, like minimum viable product and all that sort of stuff. Turns out minimum viable product for a geostationary telecommunication spacecraft is not very minimal. One of the things we decided we wanted to do from the earliest days was just draw a line in the sand and say, we as a company are going to put something in space and show that we can build a satellite and that it will work in space. Let's just figure out how to do that and do it at sort of the lowest possible cost, prove out maybe some early, you know, very early prototypes of, of some of the new technology that we wanted to be using. And then when we joined YC, we had a meeting, uh, I don't know if you remember this, but we had a meeting with, with you and our other YC partner that was basically like, okay, you have three months until you can show up on demo day and whatever you have on demo day, it better be as impressive as possible. Anything that doesn't get done until after demo day, forget about it. It won't matter. The investors won't hear about it because it won't have happened yet. So what are you going to get done in three months? And we said, we think we can build a first prototype satellite in three months. Kind of a lot of work. And it actually could take some companies years, but we said, okay, we're going to do this in three months. And so how can we show proof points both to external people, but also to ourselves to prove out that we have abilities to, to show things? And so in those like three months, built that prototype version and then built the version that we then launched and were able to operate in 2018. How did you do that? Because you were you were building this in the apartment, right? You know, a lot of the sort of core elements are, are fundamentally kind of simple. And if you're really building this as a demo, rather than for a production application, you can be flexible on what the requirements are and things like that. And knowing that this demo satellite is really just building something that's fairly basic just to prove out, can we build something? Can we integrate it? Can we deploy it to an envir operational environment? Uh, and then we can, can we do some sort of basic demo with it? Uh, and we were able to do that. We were able to do that relatively quickly. We built this first prototype satellite and we brought it to Demo Day. It was such a smashing <clears throat> success that your Demo Day video is one of the ones that we continue to play for founders in new batches because it so perfectly encapsulates what a startup can do in three months if they're really ambitious and really hardworking and really determined to do something that other people might think is impossible. We are attacking a $122 billion a year market with low cost satellites. Please come talk to us if you want to find out how much money you can make in space. Thank you. When we do our onboarding, actually part of what we show is we show uh, John's uh, YC pitch. And it's always funny looking back at that and being like, well, yeah, that's like kind of fundamentally the same thing that we said, you know, way back then when it was just two of us, not that many months into starting the company. So I love the Astronus Demo Day presentation for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first is it addresses the number one reason why anybody would not want to invest in Astronus, which is it seems impossible. Mm -hmm. They address that by showing that they've already done it. And the second is it addresses the other reason that people wouldn't want to invest in Astronus, which is that it kind of seems like it could be a science project and not really a good business. And investors want to fund stuff they can actually make money. And John does a really good job of convincing the listener that this isn't a science project. This is a real business that could be very profitable. So John had practiced 50 times over three days and got different feedback and it paid off. They raised one of the largest seed rounds at YC ever at that time. And that seed round was enough for them to actually launch a satellite into space, but they still had to be scrappy because space is expensive. Coming out of the seed that we raised uh, at the end of demo day was when we moved into the apartment, 1800 square feet. So yeah, pretty small for, for all the different things. But you know, to build a spacecraft of this size, you don't necessarily need a huge amount of infrastructure in order to do that. And so we built it on, you know, IKEA desks that were fitted with all the different things and get some ESD mats and things like that, but, you know, able to sort of put it all together. We did want to make sure that we were clean and had the right mindset when you're dealing with the space hardware. So we actually did build a cleanish room. The cleanish room was, in fact, basically a bunch of PVC piping with shower curtains. Uh, and then we sprayed the stuff called Staticide, which allegedly would basically give it a little conductive layer to make sure that, you know, the big plastic curtains aren't going to generate a bunch of static and then, you know, zap our, our things as they're coming into it. They kept making progress, kept selling, and kept growing without losing that scrappy spirit. And now, eight years later, they have more than 400 employees working out of a historic building at Pier 70. 
in an area that's quickly becoming a tech hub. And earlier this year, we visited their manufacturing facility while they were putting the finishing touches on four brand new satellites. Behind this door is where the real magic happens. This is where the actual flight hardware is being built and assembled that is going to go into space. Let's All go right. check it out. Let's go check it out. These are panels that are in different stages of, of being assembled into full satellites. What you can see right here is one of our most fully assembled satellites. So that's that, a satellite. That, that is a satellite. That is getting very close to being ready to go into space. So one of the things that we've been most thrilled with is just being able to bring a lot of our testing in-house. So for example, over here, that is a vibe or a shaker table. That is to simulate the ride to space on the rocket. So when the rocket is launching... It's bumpy. <laughs> We've all seen the movies. Yeah, <laughs> It looks exactly. like a bumpy ride up there. And so you have to test it. You have to test that your satellite can survive that. Uh, and you can actually dial in pretty specifically exactly what types of vibration modes the satellite is going to see specific to the exact rocket you're flying on. And it's an important test that we do before we ship the satellites out the door. So then through this door is a very important piece of test equipment. So these are what are called thermal vacuum chambers where we can test the satellite at hard vacuum before it ever goes into space. And they're big enough to put an entire satellite inside each one. And we have two of them, so we can do two satellites at the same time. So each of these tests is pretty significant. It can last for seven to 10 days that the satellite is sitting there. It's on, it's got all the software running. It basically thinks it's in space. So we figured out actually that we can do uh, ion thruster tests inside of this chamber as well. That was also uh, a huge win for us was discovering essentially that we could do this test in-house and use our existing facility, and not have to, to send that to somewhere else. So what satellites are going to space this year? Yeah, so we are launching four satellites. These are launching together on a single rocket. One of the bigger rockets, this is the SpaceX Falcon 9. So we went and got our own dedicated Falcon 9 launch. Oh, there's gonna be a dedicated Falcon 9 launch, just Astronus. Yes, I think we were one of the first new companies in history to go and get an entire dedicated Falcon 9. We're getting those up, getting those operational, and you know, taking this from the you know, one to end, and really getting that first thing going, which has been you know, great for scaling up. The design and the manufacturing side has been the focus over the past couple of years. And then you know, this year later, we're going to get used to operating. Instead of operating one, we're going to operate five. And there's going to be a lot of learnings and excitement and challenges with that, but we're looking forward to going through all of those. Um, but we're not just doing that. We're also developing our next generation system. And so there's a whole bunch of different things that are in work between that, other new vehicles and programs. And so it's a, it's, it's a balancing act. You don't need to be Elon Musk to start a hard tech company. If you've got some domain experience, a great co-founder, a scrappy mindset, and a lot of perseverance, regular people can actually start hard tech companies now too. I hope that hearing the story from Astranis inspires more people to start hard tech companies. Until next time, thanks for watching.